Welcome to the Virginia is for Laughers podcast brought to you by X2 Comedy. If you're looking to get more out of your Shenandoah Valley experience, then this is the podcast for you. You'll meet interesting people, musicians, and comedians that perform here and find out more about what you can do and see. Whether you live here or plan to visit, listen to explore what makes our unique slice of heaven. Now here's your host, Don Davis Womack. Hello, Lappers. Today we get to delve into the rich tapestry of local Shenandoah Valley's history. We have the honor of hosting Penny Imason, the dedicated executive director of Rocktown History, a museum, library, bookstore, and welcome center open year-round. Rocktown History is the fun name for the Harrisonburg Rockingham Historical Society. Established in 1898 as the Rockingham County Historical Society, their mission has always been to preserve and share the stories of the area and its people, highlighting their influences on our shared past. Rocktown reflects the beginning. Before Harrisonburg and Rockingham were named, there was a valley where a community informally known as Rocktown grew. The smooth valley floor served as a Native American pathway. Abundant natural resources attracted settlers and generations after. Rocktown history is more than just a repository of artifacts. It's a vibrant tapestry weaving together the stories of Harrisonburg and Rockingham County, reflecting the resilience and vision of its people. Their Welcome Center, which we are right next door from, it now serves as the official tourist information center for historic Dayton, Virginia. They have events, exhibits, and self-guided tours. Their extensive genealogy and research library offers a wide and deep collection of records, photographs, and documents. Welcome to the show, Penny. It's great to have you on today. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's an honor. It is an honor. Thank you so much for your time. Before we got here and sat down to do this interview, you gave me a tour of the museum and I did not see any of that coming to be honest with you it is unassuming from the outside about how big it is and how much it has to offer and the laughers you may have heard a little bit of a hesitation in where we were sitting because we're in the house the white house next door where her office is and before we get into this I thought That was an interesting tidbit to share. Tell us about the White House that's next door and who it served before it was your office. The White House was built around 1910. And from what I understand, it housed probably single male faculty for the Shenandoah Collegiate Institute that we now know as Shenandoah University in Winchester. So... Dayton has this rich history from the Shenandoah College years, and so now I'm sitting in a little piece of it. Well, I'm sharing this yes. with Dawn today. Yes. Uh, yeah. After I, I call that tour my one cent tour. <laughs> really? Why is that? Because my name is Penny. Oh, perfect. I should have put those two things together. I know. (laughs) Right. (laughs) What's wrong with us? What's wrong with me? (laughs) And I'm supposed to find you a sticker because you said I had no idea. Yes. And we actually had stickers made some years ago so people could walk out. Because that's what everybody says when they come inside. I, I still hear that today. So more people need to come in. I think so. It almost feels like when you walk downstairs, you're sort of underneath the ground, maybe a little bit that goes to the renovated barn that has a bunch of exhibits. Am I right about that? Wrong about there's, that? There's a small slope. So okay. that's um, the facility was built to blend in. So mm. people do come and think they're walking into a historic home. But actually, it the the home itself, the building, dates to 1993, and then we expanded in 2000. So it's really a remarkable facility for a small historical society. Wow. Yeah, we're going to get into what kinds of things people might see there. But I want to start with the origin story of Rocktown history. And can you talk about that and its evolution into the institution that it is today? I'd love to. As you mentioned, the Historical Society was formed in 1898. Basically, people in the community said, hey, we should be saving these stories. And so they initially gathered up a whole bunch of people. They had a structure of about 
16 committees a year later, and one of their plans was to build a library, and I think they plan to use a courthouse space. So over the years, it it's always been a volunteer-driven organization, so I think it's kind of had its ebbs and flows as those volunteers came and went. But by the 1960s, it seemed to really, well, actually 1947, John Walter Wayland and two others incorporated the Historical Society. So in the 1940s, it was gathering some strength. And I mentioned Dr. Wayland because he wrote so many histories and um, articles about the Shenandoah Valley. So in the 1960s, we started, we acquired the Civil War, the electric map of Stonewall Jackson Valley campaign and ran that in the municipal building. They were looking to get their own museum space and they moved into the building that is now the Virginia Quilt Museum. So from that space, we moved out here to Dayton when some land was offered to the Historical Society and built the first phase of the museum, expanded, and now we've just been growing since. Hmm. Yes, I saw that map I think you're referring to in what is your theater space, really, where you have events, right? Is that the well, one? Well, since you perform, you would call it a theater. <laughs> we call it a lecture hall, <laughs> but it is an event space uh, and we have had some performances. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really quite extraordinary. Yeah, that map is very large. How I think it's about 14 feet high. It's, yeah. It was created by the staff at Joseph Nays. And the, if anybody remembers the Joseph Nays department store, it was like walking into a New York department store. It just had incredible um, decorations. I, w- I want to call them exhibits because that's the world I live in. In retail, it would be displays. <laughs> and their staff created the, this topographical map of the Shenandoah Valley that has lights that would come on and go off and show troop movements and highlight places. Um, it, we are no longer showing the map because it did have some technical difficulties and it's, it didn't really fall into our, it was a very narrow point of history. Let's put it that way. And after 60 years, it was supposed to last for five, um, felt like it had done its job. And now we have some Um, We're working on a new way to use the map because it is extraordinary and it's Mm -hmm. so unique. And um, I'm just getting really excited about how it will help tell more history in the coming years. Yes, that will be revealed in due time. But we're excited about that in the future. And it's another many of the reasons, Laughers, that you should be following Rocktown History because there's some exciting things coming up this fall related to that that we can't really talk about at the moment. So we're going to get into some other things like what inspired you to pursue a career in preserving local history, Penny, and what challenges have you encountered along the way of, of doing this job? So, um, maybe this will be funny. I, <laughs> maybe. I, I had no background in museums, no bra- background in nonprofits, and no background in history, really. So, I always give a full disclosure when I'm talking to groups and people. Uh, but I became aware of the fact that some changes were being made out here and they needed an administrator. And I had a small business background, finance, and so I came to work part-time. And within a year, the first executive director um, found an opportunity she couldn't refuse. And after a few days, I kind of, I mean, I, she called me in to talk, and I thought I was being called on the carpet. I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, what did I do? And she told me she was leaving, and I was in such shock. I just... Really, it took me a few days to say, wait a minute, they might replace her. And so I, you know, I raised my hand and I said, I'd like to be the director. Um, Not really knowing exactly everything I was getting myself into. And it has been uh, an amazing journey of learning. I go to any conference I can go to, to learn about history, museums, nonprofits, fundraising, whatever it takes. Uh, there's a, I wear a lot of hats and sometimes I 
maybe I should say I juggle a lot of balls and sometimes I'll drop one and it rolls under a sofa and I'm like, oh my gosh, I forgot all about that. But for the most part, I'm surrounded by great people. And as I mentioned, it's a volunteer organization and I just, they, they make me look good. I just, you know, I love it. And actually, it turns out I love history. I was a math and German major. so <laughs> You weren't um, expecting this then, were you? No, I wasn't. Yeah. But what I realize is history research is like solving a puzzle. Really? And that's, I think, what I love. I just love finding the details, yeah. you know, organizing the details, and but trying to get to the answer. Mm. And maybe there's not always an answer, but the more you learn and the, you know, the different pieces you can put together. You're, you're, you're building that puzzle and you get a better image. A better picture of what it was like in the past for the people. That's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. So much fun. I, th- I threatened to quit my job just so I could research. <laughs> But you know, that's, that's not a practical application right now. So uh, no. What would you say is one of the most exciting things you've found in your own personal research about history of this area for you? I could probably, I, I mean, I've been here quite a while. So yeah. there've been a lot of really remarkable moments, but what is so fascinating about history today mm-hmm. is that we have the internet and mm-hmm. there is so much more of made made available. Um, I, Ed Ayers, great historian from Richmond, um, civil war historian. He, he talks about technology being like a microscope or even a telescope into the past. Mm -hmm. So we can find details, but we can look further. I mean, broader, I mean, it's just so much to find. So I was trying to, we have a photograph of, a circus parade in Harrisonburg. And I, you can see some signs in the background and I'm trying to figure out what parade was this? When was this? And so as I'm doing the research into whatever circus it was, I'm, then I find information about the circus. To this day, I still have a, t- a pin open on a website that actually the circus created a diary after the year, the season's tour. And it actually states on this day, we were in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and the previous day, you know, our scouts went down to see the other circus down in Stanton. They were here before <laughs> wow. us. And y'all, I was like dying. I just, sometimes I find the the most amazing details. And so this was something I was working on for a social media post. I mean, really? and now, I mean, at the it's not quite a term paper. I haven't written it yet, <laughs> but I think it'll become a blog. And then maybe I'll get back to posting the image and giving some information. But I just, sometimes I just can't stop. Mm. And you're from this area. You said you grew up here. We were talking about that as you were giving me the scent tour. <laughs> yeah, the one scent tour. The one scent tour. I grew up in Harrisonburg and I now live in Rockingham. Um, it was... My family's been here for several generations. And so I, but I, I, this is another funny thing. I always think I graduated from Harrisonburg High School, <laughs> but I didn't. No. Um, you know, I crashed the reunions, I guess, because I moved down to Lexington after my sophomore year in high school. So uh-huh. then I was gone for about 20 years or so and came back. Didn't plan to come back, wasn't trying to stay away, but it's been so serendipitous because I'm close to family again and my kids get to, you know, live in the area that I grew up in and it's, what could be more beautiful? Yeah, it's beautiful here. That's for sure. We had been living in Pine Barrens down south and every time we crest a hill, I didn't remember Harrisonburg as being hilly. Every time we crest a hill, I'm like, look at the view. Look at the view. <laughs> that, <laughs> so, yes. It's just gorgeous. It is stunning views around here in the Shenandoah Valley. We take it for granted when we're driving around, I find, you know, I'll notice it more if I go leave town and I come back and I look around and see the mountain views. I'm like, wow. This is a beautiful place. So you the know? problem is people think I know everything from around here. And I <laughs> had just started driving when I moved away. So, you know, it's like, oh, you know how to get there. I'm like, <laughs> um, yeah, right. <laughs> I just like fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll do a little bit of that, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and you have events here too. There's an ongoing one that started in January called Coffee Mills. That sounds super fascinating to me. I was reading a little bit about it, but I'm not the expert here about these events. You are. Can you tell us more about them and their significance and engaging in the community? What What is it? 
what, what will happen if somebody comes to one of these? I'm so glad you asked because the coffee mills have been so much fun and we actually started them in the fall. So oh, okay. Thank you. We've, we, I think, I still think in terms of semesters. Um, <laughs> Me too. In the graduated fall, forever we, ago. The coffee mills are just an opportunity for people who like to talk about history or want to learn more about history to come in and chat. And we, we call them informal conversations. We now have a curator on staff. So we kind of task him to um, have something to spark the conversation. And... People have been coming back time after time, so I, it's it's catching on. We included some music, so the curator doesn't have to be on tap every single time. Um, our Welcome Center manager is Andrea Early, and she is part of the Shape Note singing community. So she brought in a few friends and serenaded us last month. And the music was gorgeous. We were down in the gallery uh, we've also looked at samplers that are that this is a fascinating story last fall. We received a sampler. It's just delightful. It has very interesting um, stitching, little iconography. And as we were trying to compare it to something else that we have, we noticed there was some embroidery underneath the the textile that we went to look at. So mm -hmm. a sampler and a show towel. Sorry, I didn't explain this very well. We have, we received a sampler and it was so unusual. We decided to see if maybe it was a show towel. I won't go into all the descriptions, but just remember sampler show towel. So as we were looking at the show towel to compare it to the new sampler, we found a sampler underneath that had the same designs as the new sampler. And that was just crazy. So it was a mother and a daughter. And oh, we wow. think that these two samplers, you know, finally found their way back together after, I don't know, a hundred years or something. So that was pretty exciting. So, um, somebody got on social media and said, do you have a textile Tuesday every month? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> um, no, but we'll try. Yeah. So I've kept her name so I can say, come back for textile Tuesday. So yeah. then we had Tuneful Tuesday. It's it's random. So different topics. Yes. yes. Do, do people know what the topic is going to be before they get here? Is it more of a bit of a surprise? It's just the nights are set and then you just come and then you hear what the topic is when you get here. Well, for the coffee mills, yeah. if we know what the topic is, well, people know. And those okay. are at 930 in the morning. The museum is normally open from 10 to 4, but we open early. We brew coffee and have fresh cream from Mount Crawford Creamery. Coffee hound coffee. <laughs> and so that lasts for however long it lasts in the morning. People will stick around. You know, they chit chat beforehand. We talk about whatever the object is that week and then chit chat a little bit more. And it's, it's really been fun. We also have mostly monthly third Thursday talks. And this past month... We had Peggy Shiflett come and talk about her recent book about Appalachian life. And she's done a lot of work um, studying Appalachia and her family was from Hopkins Gap. She grew up in Hopkins Gap. So she leans heavily on her family stories in her books. So she recently published her fifth book and that was fabulous. I mean, she... She has candor and humor. <laughs> and it's my kind of gal. Yeah. <laughs> you need to talk to her. Yeah. Oh, she would be a absolutely. great guest on the podcast. She was so much fun. Um, this coming month, our curator, Scott Suter, is going to be talking about the tradition of basket weaving, special kind of basket weaving. Some kind of, bas some kind of basket weaving. White, white oak. Excuse me. There it is. Yes. So, um, I'll be learning along too. <laughs> yes, I would be too. I don't know what's going on with that. I think the last basket I weaved was in Girl Scouts, but mm. that was a few Was it decades. construction paper? Because that would have been me. I'm not even <laughs> sure. <laughs> we learned to weave with construction paper. We, uh, we also like to have special events occasionally, um, or hopefully more regularly. But in March, we have a woman coming... On a Saturday morning, Marie Runquist will be talking about the research she did through DNA testing wow. and just actual research. 
well, about her family. She's related to Acadians who were kicked out of Canada and settled in the Maryland area. So I think that's going to be quite fascinating. Yeah, you have a variety of events. Mm-hmm. What, do you, how, what do you feel is the significance of having these events in terms of engaging the community with Rocktown history? I think people are just curious. Mm-hmm. You know, there are so many people. I mean, there are a lot of people who love history. Mm-hmm. And then there are people who say they don't. But then they they will read historical fiction or they'll watch movies based on history. That's me. And yeah. it kind of turns out, well, maybe this history is kind of interesting. I find that when I'm reading a book, I have to stop and go and try to find that picture or find that person. And so trying to get the backstory, I love anything behind the scenes. Um, but so the thing about history, not only do we build some understanding of what happened in the past, but that helps us to understand the world we're living in today. Mm-hmm. You know, I when, agree with that. When you're driving down Liberty Street in Harrisonburg, you might not know it was once called German Street. And then you learn that it was called German Street. And you're like, well, why did they change the name? Well, they changed the name in 1918. Well, what was happening in 1918? There was a war in Europe. And so there's just so many connections in in the homes we're sitting in or in the streets we drive around in, the way the communities grow and all of that life before impacts the life we have today. And so we're trying to make connections for people. So we do offer a wide variety of programs. Um, I'm sure we would love to offer more, but what we're trying to do is make sure that we, we can bring history so more community members can enjoy it. Yeah, there's so much you said in there too about that. I was reading about your website and all that you had to offer. And then I was digging into the genealogy resources that you have. And then I saw Turner Ashby and then I was going off on a tangent and Googling and wikipedia and looking up who Turner Ashby really was. And then I was reading, he sounded like quite a character, to be honest with you. He was uh, one of Stonewall Jackson's problem child, <laughs> it sounded like. So, well, well and others would just call him Gallant. Gallant. What does that even mean? <laughs> Help educate me. I'm learning um, a word today, laughers. <laughs> well, maybe you would say gallant. A uh, gallant. Yeah. 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 So. yeah. It's very fascinating. You have a wealth of information. I agree with that significance. Thank you for sharing. And we're randomly recording here at that White House next door to the museum. At a time where I'm realizing I am significantly hungry, which is why I'm glad that I brought us some absurdly flavorful pre popsterous popcorn, our sponsor's popcorn. I brought you some. What do you think? I'm going to try it. Okay. You're talking with your mouth full. <laughs> Didn't your mother tell you? She did. Okay. I'm, I'm not listening. <laughs> I'm lucky because I have two flavors in my bag of the Windy City Mix. We aim to so, over-deliver it. We're yeah. genius for lavers. <laughs> What's so incredible is how big these popcorn kernels pop. Mmm. Mmm. That's... The cheese flavor. I love the I love the cheddar cheese. Ooh, it's good. It's one good. of my favorites. Pretty color too. Mm-hmm. All right, but I also get the caramel, which yeah. honestly, who doesn't love caramel? Mm-hmm. This is sure. This would be great at the ballpark. Mm-hmm. Do they make a ballpark mix? I don't know. I'll have to ask mm-hmm. them. If Baseball they can. season's coming. Mm-hmm. This makes me think of Cracker Jack, except it's better. It is better. So delicious. You know that their kernels are grown right here, not within a, sh- it's not far from here. It's within a short driving distance. So this is locally sourced, amazing popcorn. And oh my gosh. their factory is 100% nut free. And they are Shenandoah's Valley's only award winning popcorn. How about that? That's the trifecta power right there. It's amazing. They are just such a success story. I've always been impressed with um, with this story. Mm. So now I'm impressed even more with this popcorn. Mm-hmm. Yes. Laffers. Thank, thank you for sharing. You bet. And Laffers, 
This popcorn is a perfect gift for any occasion, birthdays, anniversaries, literally anything you can think of. Plus, Laughers, you can get a 15% discount using promo code LAFF15. Just visit Prepopsterous today. That's P-R-E-P-O-P-S-T-E-R-O-U-S dot com. Use that code and get some of this delicious popcorn today. Mmm. <laughs> <laughs> now back to you, Penny. Seriously. How does Rocktown history bridge the gap between preserving the past and making it relevant to present day life? You you alluded to that. Let's let's kind of take it a little bit more specifically. Uh, there was a, a maybe an exhibit, for example, where it can just bring the, that point to life that comes to mind. I think that's always the challenge in public history. Mm-hmm. So at Rocktown History, we take history from scholars and you know, all those people research, write books and do the hard history. And then we figure out how to translate it or interpret it. So in the museum world, we're talking about interpretation. We want to make it um, easy for anybody to come in without having a bunch of background knowledge to come in and be able to connect with something in the panels or the objects. And that's always the challenge for us. When we look at a specific object, it's, you know, what story does it tell? Mm-hmm. And, you know, who held it before? How did they use it? Why did they need it? Uh, we've had such a variety. We we offer featured exhibits, and so those are up for temporarily, and then we have our permanent gallery, which is semi-permanent. We do try to update that as well. Down in the Civil War Gallery, for example, there's a story about the burning of the courthouse records. Mm. And in 1864, you know, things were coming to a head, and some... Some well-meaning citizens decided that the courthouse records should be taken to a safe place. Mm -hmm. And when kids are in the gallery, I'll say, they headed east, and they should have headed west. Because lo and behold, as they're dragging this wagon east, Union officers come along, Union soldiers come along, and light the records on fire. So the books are burning. Um, A woman named Mary Nicholas Kiesel ran out and tamped down the fire. A lot were destroyed, which is super frustrating for people who want to study their family history because there were records, deeds, and whatnot that were lost. But some of the records were saved. And so uh, Chaz Haywood from the circuit court has loaned one of the burned books. So you can look at that burned book and realize that it was on that wagon in the spring of 1864. And I have told this story so many times and I still get chills. I just did too. It's so funny you said that. That's exactly what I'm experiencing right now. So maybe not every object is as dramatic, but there are, you know, people are different, different, I'm sorry, people are interested in different things. So we, we offer our exhibits and some, we definitely have panels if you're a reader we, we have some little highlights for younger audiences. We try to make sure that parents come in with smaller children. The children might be occupied with little hands-on activities so that the parents can read. Um, but we also have our newsletters. We, I'm working on having a more active blog. We go out into the community and talk to groups. Um, I think the best thing, one of our best examples, and was the the premiere of the documentary that some students created for us on, it's called Knocking Down Walls, and it's about the desegregation of the schools in Virginia. Wow. But the, the reason we sponsored this program and have it here in Harrisonburg is because there was a federal courthouse judge at the federal courthouse in Harrisonburg who made decisions um, while some students from other counties were suing to go to school. So students here created this documentary about students then, and we were able to premiere that at Court Square Theater. And it's, it's just incredible. It's such a moving and important piece of information, and it has its roots here 
part of the story is from Harrisonburg. So very proud of that. You should be very proud of that. You have an incredible selection of exhibits in that museum. It's very extensive. I, I really was, I'm going to have to definitely come back and spend some more time. I love museums and I love history for exactly the reason that you were talking about earlier. I think it helps us make sense of where we are in life and what is happening and how we got here. And we can learn from the mistakes of the past as well as the, you know, many accomplishments and it's the life is grief and gratitude as my main therapist always says and I think history reflects that there's a lot of grief and gratitude and it's important to look at all of it to be able to create a better future together as a, hum, a human race in my opinion so you're you doing are amazing a great work. ambassador thank you <laughs> you are welcome <laughs> I think it's amazing I love sitting around I love watching the documentaries at museums and and looking at all the panels and seeing all the artifacts and you have a lot of them. And then you have this extensive genealogy resource resources available. What are some of the most memorable discoveries of family stories you've encountered through that, through the genealogy library? Well, I've had the opportunity to help a number of people. Um, usually I leave that to Margaret. Margaret Hotchner is our researcher and administrator and she is incredible. And she, you know, talk about going down the rabbit holes for people. She just this week, I think it was two days ago, I happened to be in the library and I heard this man say, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. And he had been searching for, I think, the burial site of an ancestor, mm. and Margaret found it. Wow. And he said he had gone all the way to Martinsburg, and they, I don't know, he just did not get satisfaction. And somebody told him to come to us, and Margaret found that. I think one of the funniest things was when I was in the library, and a woman said, discovered that she'd been celebrating the wrong birth date. And so that was like, wow, I guess she got some information. So, you know, often people come because they're looking for a needle in a haystack and it's always exciting if we can help, you know, help them solve their puzzle. Sadly, sometimes those burned records would have helped, but it's, we, we just don't give up. Mm. Yeah. It's whenever possible, you know, dating early, early, early. Some people don't realize that they have to go down to Augusta County because Rockingham was formed out of Augusta. And so at some point we might say, you need to talk to the Augusta County records people. Mm -hmm. But it's really fun to see how people connect. Some people really get into it. When Peggy Shiflett came to speak, her cousin had mentioned that she had 30,000 people in the family tree that she had she had researched. Oh my gosh. I know. It's That's great. extensive. It's great. Yeah. So it's, it's a fun hobby. And, you know, the genealogy bugs can be a, an interesting breed mm. because they, they remember and they talk and they, you know, Margaret gets all excited about telling me stuff. And I, sometimes I can't even follow, <laughs> but you know, I'm excited that she's excited. I'm excited. She's excited too. <laughs> you have, <laughs> you have the local resources. I also noticed though on the website that you're connected to more extensive resources for That's people's right. genealogy, like ancestry. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. Yeah. So people have been coming into the Valley for a long time and many people continue on. And so our, our resources are not solely Harrisonburg, Rockingham. We concentrate on that, but we also have other counties in Virginia, other states, and we provide access to Ancestry and Family Search in the library. So the visiting the library is free and people can come in any time. We encourage appointments and could sit on the library computer. Uh, from what I understand, our, our Family Search offers some information that you wouldn't necessarily get at home. Um, so people who are interested or already know about family search might want to stop in and just see what they can find. And then that since you don't have to be from Rockingham County mm. or Harrisonburg. 
Okay. That's good to know. Then if someone comes in and they just have, haven't even gone down the road, they haven't even taken the first step to figure out from whence they come mm -hmm. and what, where their relatives were and lived here and when and all of that. Let's say somebody's interested, but they haven't even taken the first step. And this is somewhere they can go to take that first step. What advice would you give to them to begin that journey? So the best thing to do is to just start with yourself and then think, who are my parents? And then who are their grandparents? And that gives you, you know, the structure of your family tree. And then you keep just trying to go back. And instead of getting all tied up in who all the siblings of those generations, just work on your direct lineage. And um, then if you, the problem is after just what, three generations, mm -hmm. you might not remember. Mm -hmm. like, I never spoke to my great grandmother. So that generation is unknown to me. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it can go by so fast that it really just documenting. And then um, if, you're, if you're serious about it, then you might not put anybody on your family tree until you know what their actual name was and their, their dates, where they're buried, who they married. So there's some basic information that you're looking for, you know, names, dates, marriages, children. That sort of thing. But it's the thing is, it goes back and it goes back and it goes back and it goes back and then it gets wider. So mm. it's really, it can be fun. I play around on Ancestry. I have to say, I, I do more research for work than I do for myself. But um, it's kind of fun to go back. Like right now, we're planning towards the 250th. Oh yeah, that's coming up 2026, right? Exactly. The 20 so, and that's the 200 for people that are not aware, that's the 250th birthday of the state of Virginia, right? Of the United States. I'm sorry. Wow. 1776. See, I need to go back to civic school. <laughs> <laughs> I love civics. Civics it's all about civics. But for for the 250th, yeah. maybe people would like to think um could I get back to a revolutionary ancestor? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um I'm sure members of the, oh, I'm sure our library would love to help people with that. And then you'd have a connection to that period in history. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. It's not that easy to do. I wouldn't imagine but. so. <laughs> but Are, it's a good game. It is a good game. Are there like graphs out there that you can fill in, that like uh, templates yes. that yep. people can yep. get? So you just Google those types of things and yes, get it? Yes, you can. Okay. All family charts. We have some in the library too. Okay. Yeah. Are any resources available that would help with that available in the bookstore? What's in the bookstore? The bookstore has information, um, lots of information about local places. Mm. If there is a genealogy book that has been published, then we will carry that. We have a lot of Pat Turner Ritchie's books from the Brock's Gap area. We also have a number of local history books that may talk about the people in a community. And so I would certainly recommend people coming in to peruse those. But generally upstairs, we also, I mean, you can go upstairs and just look. I was looking up Hinkles yesterday, and there's some Hinkle genealogy books. Um, it's, we, we, we try to capture anything. We also have resources online, you know. Um, cemetery records, veteran records. There's a fair amount of information that's available on the, our website. Yes, I saw, speaking of that, I saw Civil War soldier resources and American Revolutionary War soldier resources, and you could click on it, and then it had a list of names in alphabetical order. That yeah. was pretty amazing yeah. to see, too. We have volunteers who created databases over years, mm -hmm. years, years, and um, we're trying to scan obituaries, mm. and I don't even think they've gotten through the A's in the past year. So our, <laughs> we have a, obituary files that, I mean, it's just amazing the work that people have done in order to capture this information, and um, it's just I just can't say enough about the dedicated volunteers. 
Yes, let's talk about the volunteers. What role do they play on the day-to-day operations and the success of Rocktown history? Let's elaborate on that. Let's talk yes, about these volunteers. they are the heroes. They are the heroes. They're the real MVPs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so when you walk in the front door, more than likely you'll be greeted by a volunteer. We have wonderful people who some have history in their background and they like to talk about history when people come in and others just like to meet people and, you know, get out of the house and spend some time behind, um, like in our bookstore. So that's uh, a role that's very important and you just need to have a smile, (laughs) you know, (laughs) then um, upstairs in the genealogy library, I mentioned the people who are collecting the data. They have been at it for so long. We also have used off-site help. We can, for example, copy the indices in the back of those genealogy books, and people can sit at home and type them up so that we can add those to our databases so people know that that particular name is in that book. Mm. And it's just another shortcut for people to use the library. We have a wonderful collections team who maintain the objects and when people so people come in most of our collections have been donated Mm. and you could talk about the donation of time that the genealogy people use to gather that data but we have people who bring in either family treasures or things that they purchased at an auction at some point they're downsizing you don't know what it could be anything any day the other day somebody brought in uniforms that I think her father wore. And we have a lot of uniforms, but this included a flight suit, like mm. a, like a whole overall jumpsuit kind of thing. I don't think he jumped out of the plane, but it would have been what he wore in the plane, not his formal uniform. And I had never seen that before. So that was kind of interesting. Sometimes it's a quilt. Sometimes it's photographs. Sometimes it's uh, a tool, a tool, a pair of eyeglasses, you know, maybe it's in a case and it mentions Tolliver's jewelry down in Harrisonburg. And, you know, there's so many things that walk through the door. We never know what's going to come. We can't keep them all, but we love to see them all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, volunteers have helped with exhibitions, landscaping, uh, writing. It's I mean, everything that you need to do to run the business that is Rocktown History can use volunteer help at some point. Hmm. Painting. Painting. (laughs) Organizing. Shredding. I mean, it's just (laughs) incredible what the volunteers can help with. There's a plethora to do around here is what I'm hearing. Yes. Yes. Uh, You brought something up that has made me curious to ask you this question when the, you can't keep them all, but stuck out, stuck out to me that you can't keep everything that people bring in. Is there a criteria that you use to figure out which items are going to be good for a Rocktown Histories mission and maybe not? I Can you elaborate on that more? We are fine tuning that. Okay. So we... We hired Scott Souter as our curator. He works part-time. Yes, you did get to meet him. Very helpful, delightful man. Part of his mission was to formalize that process. And he, one of our trustees, took on the collections committee as her project. And so there is a committee of people and they have sort of laid the groundwork for making sure that we are making decisions that are in the best interest of the object and local history. So for example, if it's something that's too big, then it would be, we've been offered some tool that's like the the length of this room Mm. and where would we put it? How would we store it? Um, So that's still to be seen. Because I think Scott really wants to get it. It's just, <laughs> he's about to work on that. I have um, a feeling we might see it. <laughs> but if we, if it, if it duplicates something that we already have in the collection, mm. and then we, we offer it back to the donor. We ask the donor, so would you like to have it back, or would you like us to try to find another home for it? And um, so that's up to the donor. Sometimes on our, well, actually on our donation form, it says that we might 
use it to raise funds to support the collection. So we have put books in the bookstore to sell. Um, we have, you know, there have been items that have gone to auction and that's just general practice in museums that you, you create a, a criteria and after a while, I mean, even the Valentine in Richmond was deaccessioning lots of objects, but we want to be transparent about that, that we can't, we, not everything is appropriate and we can't necessarily take care of everything. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's our duty. We are, people are entrusting us with this history. So we want to make sure that we are caring for it in the best possible way. We Mostly we like to send it off to another museum or historical society if it seems more appropriate. Mm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's That was helpful to me. You have the exhibits and you have events. There's going to be future exhibits and future events coming. I'm wondering if you can give us a little behind the scenes peek, if you will, of some upcoming exhibits and events you think the Laughers should mark on their calendars. Well, opening day of baseball season is coming. And yeah. this happens to be the 100th anniversary of the Rockingham County Baseball League. Whoa. I know. Play ball. <laughs> so we will be installing an RCBL exhibit what? in April. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I happen to be a baseball fan. So yeah. I, I think this will be a fun one. I'm um, behind the scenes, I'm trying to come up with the idea for the graphics. I'll tell you one thing. Okay. Finding a volunteer graphics designer. Mm. That's like impossible. And yeah. I don't blame them. Uh, that's fine. So but. JMU students out there, if you're <laughs> exactly. listening, um. she, you, you could be giving back to <laughs> your community while you're visiting here with us. Or if yeah. you're a resident, even better. If you're from Harrisonburg and going to JMU and you're in graphic design, you need to call Rockdown History. Please continue. There, <laughs> there is potential. Uh, but basically behind the scenes before an exhibit, we sort of gather up the information. Um, we had guest curators in the past. And so I would work with them and try to get a visual of what story they're trying to tell and how we're going to tell it. And... For example, when Kevin Borg did the patent exhibit, he had done all this research on patents that had been awarded to people who lived in Harrisonburg and Rockingham, going back to like 1838, butter churn. And the backdrop for that exhibit was the art that's created for the patents. And back in the day, there were these beautiful sketches mm. that would show the, the item I Di see diagram it. the item. So she was pointing to one in her office. I, I see it now. I have a plow, a yeah. plow in my office. And so the artwork was the main focus, but all the stories were told in the labels. So getting an idea for what's going into an exhibit, what the stories will be, if there's something that will offer that punch of color or the inspiration for a font, then that's part of preparing for the exhibits. We currently have an exhibit on 125 years of the Historical Society. And in the display is this huge screen that was a backdrop. It's a, actually, it's a huge canvas that was the backdrop at a local school. And it has all these advertisements in these great colors of yellow and green. And so that was the inspiration for the color and the fonts in that exhibit. What's really cool is that there, all these advertisements make you think of a baseball field. So oh, I think it will yeah. get to stay in the next exhibit, but we will come up with new, a new look, so to speak, for the pamphlets and whatever we produce. Okay. And that exhibit will be among the exhibits that I saw earlier today. It will have a special space and all right. of that. Okay. The featured gallery, all of the stuff that's in the 125 exhibit will become baseball. Okay, mm -hmm. that's great. And we'll broaden the reach here because we're in Dayton. So if there is a Bridgewater College graphic design student, I don't know if they <laughs> have a Mennonite. program. Eastern Mennonite. <laughs> Listen, students, this is an opportunity to be part of something impactful with your arts and your skills, wouldn't you say? Yes. Okay, so we just want We love interns. I didn't mention those. I think we have four students this semester. Okay. So, Yes. 
What what majors do they usually come from to do an internship here? Usually history. <laughs> <laughs> that made sense. I didn't know. I was yeah. just checking it out. I just I majored in exercise science, so I don't I'm not well versed on all the majors there. But there's a lot of nuances too and a lot of majors that are yeah. existing today that didn't exist before. Speaking of history. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna date ourselves. <laughs> I know. Let's, so moving on. <laughs> In your opinion, what makes Harrisonburg and Rockingham County's history unique compared to the other regions in Virginia? Well, going back to the introduction when you were talking about the valley, um, when we think about settlement, what did settlers need? Water. So we had abundant resources. We have this fertile ground. So Few people probably know that Rockingham County is always one of the top three agriculture producers. And we have such a strong history in agriculture. That's that's one of my visions is someday that we would build a comprehensive history of agriculture in Rockingham. Because that would be really cool. I think that, um, and it needs to come up to date because we have grapes and we have hemp and there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's so much going on. We used to have so many orchards mm -hmm. and the orchards have shrunk. Um, there's certainly more cows. I, I see more cows than poultry in my travels, but poultry is obviously a big, big part of the economy here. Mm -hmm. And that affects, um, the story of our community. And even in that is adjacent to immigration, because mm -hmm. who came to work in on the farms? It's also interesting history mm -hmm. for World War II because there was a prisoner of war camp in Timberville. That's right. And so they had Germans picking the apples because the Americans were on the front lines. Another point would be the the impact of the Brethren and Mennonite culture. I on, agree. And so if we were lucky, we would have a buggy go by. But Mm -hmm. Hasn't happened today. No. And if you've never <laughs> been to the Shenandoah Valley, that you will see in Dayton, Virginia, especially on Sunday, a lot of horse and buggies because they're coming to, the, the Mennonites are coming to and from church. But I you still get excited to see them. I love it. I see them every day and it's just, it's still, it's still unique. I love the uniqueness of that so much. It's so, it's an exciting sighting for me too. <laughs> uh, as, uh, how does a uh, Rocktown history collaborate with the local schools or educational institutions to enrich students understanding of their heritage? Well, as I mentioned, uh, we did have that, that program, the knocking down walls documentary was created in conjunction with the Rockingham County public schools. We, have a second iteration. Uh, two of those students are continuing on to do some more work that will ultimately in will have an exhibit, a permanent exhibit space, and hopefully a historic marker downtown. We also work with Skyline Literacy. Their citizenship classes come for tours. So I'll be hosting two of those next week. And we just try to help them, um, as you mentioned, civics earlier, yes. um, yeah. help them on their pathway to citizenship and understanding more about the community. Um, we have next week, I'll also be getting in um, meeting with a new committee that's going to focus on education and how we can serve younger people. I mean, we've talked about day camps, week summer camps. We've talked about field trips. We've talked about um, just different ways to make the gallery a little more kid-friendly. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully now that we'll have this new committee, some of those options will, will start to play out. Um, in the past, if if a school wants to come visit, we say yes, and we try to accommodate them. Uh, we've hosted the Massanutten Regional Library's um, summer reading program kids in the past, and I, I would really love to develop future museum goers and history lovers. So that's, it's always, it's just one of those things. Sometimes you just need the right volunteer to come along, and mm -hmm. I think that um, this new committee will help a lot. I think so too. I'm excited to see what comes out of that. Yes. Yeah. 
We also have a new project this that you've mentioned in the fall that will um, be a new presentation of a local history orientation. And that has educators on the team, but there's one specific educator that will align the new presentation with the school's SOLs mm. so that we can develop the supplemental materials for the teachers, whether they come to the museum or not. Um, we want them to have the information that they can use in their classrooms. Oh, that's good. I like that. You've got some plans, which is a great segue into my next question. As the executive director, what are your long-term visions and goals for Rocktown history? That's such a big question. I know. <laughs> is it if you say it out loud, then you have to make it happen or that it no. happens? You speak it into the immersive. You can it speak come. it into the immersive. And we always be open to be flexible, to tweak it to wherever it okay. leads. <laughs> well... Let me just say that we have had some wonderful partnerships yeah. with um, outside groups. And I think that when we're working together and we can bring people together to tell the, the richer stories, the broader, deeper, um, making sure that we're connecting for as many people that we can, um, that has been so successful. What, what we don't see enough of is people coming into the physical museum. I'm afraid that COVID really cut our numbers and it's, it's been a slow, a slow return. So I would love to see, you know, more people taking advantage, advantage of the museum itself. Um, as you mentioned, there are so many stories down there, there and are, people are always so truly. surprised. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, I think we exceed expectations and I, it's, it's just a resource more people should know about and take advantage of. Especially, you know, people don't want to be, people always think they will do something that's in their own backyard. Mm -hmm. But perhaps if they think more in terms of um, somebody's coming to visit us, what are we going to do with them? Hey, let's just pop into the museum. You could spend a, an hour, you could spend most half a day. Dayton is a great destination. I used to yes. rent cars. I'd say, go to Dayton. <laughs> <laughs> There's some, plenty to do in Dayton in a day. Um, we have been um, associated with the, the not Thomas Harrison house in Harrisonburg. The not and Thomas and Harrison. What is the not Thomas and Harrison house? <laughs> okay. So <laughs> Thomas Harrison is considered Harrisonburg's founder. Yes. He and his wife gave the two and a half acres that the initial town that represented the initial town space, and then they gave additional acreage. There is a stone house on Bruce Street. Yes. Right. So that's the Thomas Harrison house, or it was until um, our little project team had some archaeological work done and dendrochronology of wood. And it seems that. The house was built after Thomas Harrison died. Mm. The property, I mean, it could still be a Harrison house. The, his sons were around. The property was clearly part of Thomas Harrison's property. Um, but there's been an effort to look at the property, to figure out how to restore it, how to interpret it. And part of the space... There's a continuum of the stone house, a brick house called the Hall House, and then the facade that sits on the corner of Bruce and Main, mm -hmm. a curved corner, uh, represents three um, centuries of Harrisonburg growth, mm -hmm. business. You know, there's stories that can be told from that location, and um, we would love to have a history hub of some sort, a history museum, a community space, whatever it is. Um, that's, that would be my, my greatest goal. If I could bring some history into downtown Harrisonburg, mm -hmm. that's the focus for, you know, there are other little historical spots, but I would, I would like to bring the historical society's mission down to Harrisonburg. That'd be great. That's the Harrisonburg, Rockingham County, historical county connection right there. Exactly. And yeah. I, I think that that would be an opportunity to not only get all the foot traffic on Main Street, but there would be many more people who would be aware of us, volunteer, mm -hmm. donate, all that kind of stuff. So I think it would, it would be... Good visibility. Right. We did some First Fridays. Yeah. But it's, it takes a lot of momentum. Mm. I almost need like an exhibit space to start with downtown. 
Well, we did it a couple first Fridays. Uh, <laughs> it was a pop-up. <laughs> oh, yeah. I know about pop-ups. <laughs> yeah. Because we I, do the pop-up comedy. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Is that, there's a lot to it. Was it easy to pack? Well, the library loaned us chairs and most of the stuff fit in my car. And <laughs> <laughs> we showed a film once okay. and um, had some other history about the, the that particular corner. So I think it's, there's so much to tell. There's so mm-hmm. much to tell. And there's so many people who can help. So when the time comes and the property's ready, I think that that's, that would be, I mean, I used to talk to other people about different properties. And so, but this one seems to be the ideal location. Mm-hmm. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Indeed. Can you share with us a favorite antidote or piece of history that you think encapsulates the essence of Rocktown history? <sighs> Um, this is where you need a visual. Yeah. So Maybe we, when we I post can, about it, we can include that. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you a, a visual. Okay. So Rocktown history is all about, um, the stories of our past mm-hmm. and, you know, bringing in the different aspects of cultures that have helped to establish this community. It's about researching family is a genealogy library. It's about community input and working together, partnering. So uh, I think it was around 2011, we had an exhibit of documents that are called Froctor. And they, Froctor are documents that are birth and baptismal certificates, perhaps a house blessing or a school document. And they are part of the Pennsylvania Dutch tradition. So down in the folk art gallery, we have several examples, a prolific artist and they, Oh, they have folk art. So these are documents that have been painted on little birds and insects or flowers, whatever. And so a prolific artist was a man named Peter Bernhardt. And there are the, the exhibit gathered from the community all of the froctor that people had. And Alan Litton, who was a photographer for us, DNR photographer for a long time, but he would take a picture of it and send it home because they're very valuable. And we gathered up all of these froctor, which showed us um, some commerce because Bernhardt initially was writing everything out. You know, so-and-so was born. These were her parents. These were the godparents. This was the minister. This is where she was born. You know, all this family history information was in the document. And he was writing it all out and then painting his little whimsical things around it. Then he, you can, we have an example of where he's pre-printed and it was more like fill in the blank. So Mm -hmm. you get the impression that business must have been good. Mm -hmm. So there's this commercial enterprise kind of history, the history, the culture that tells us what was important. People were willing to pay somebody to make this document. Mm -hmm. So they kept them and they were usually, they wouldn't have been framed in the house or something. It would have been folded up in a Bible. Um, It, it gave us, um, all these beautiful images on the wall. Mm. It was fascinating because when people came to allow us to photograph and we captured the information and we put the, your fractor next to our fractor and they're related. It was the same artist. They yeah. were cousins or something like that. Yeah. People did, who didn't know they were related to each other were connected this way. Uh, it was, there were more artists than just Bernhardt. But to me, those those pieces of paper, those archives are, are something that represent everything that we do. Mm. Um, this new, this new program coming in the fall, that might, that might be the next one. But for the most part, I think that we want to, we want to save the stories Mm -hmm. as many as we can. Um, there are a lot of wonderful people in this community who are doing similar things and share with us. We share with them. You know, we're trying to all support each other because we think it's important that, that our place be recognized as valuable and, um, and that the home that people have, the visitors who come, they can see how unique it is and, you know, just enjoy the surroundings that are also beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's true. 
And for laughers out there that may not be in our locality and not know what the DNR is, it's the Daily News Record, which is our local newspaper. So those of the listeners, we have several that listen that are from here, but then we have global listeners and they might have just wondered what that was. So we're cluing you in because you're part of our community. And I wanted to ask, this is an important question, Penny, I think. How can individuals support and contribute the preservation efforts of Rocktown history and help you? So kind of you to ask. Absolutely. I would not be doing my job if I didn't give a small moment. (laughs) That's Um, right. (laughs) So I mentioned all the volunteers, but really um, there have been members and donors. Those, Those people are the backbone of the organization and have been. It takes a lot of resources to maintain a museum. And when you come to visit and find out how large ours is, you'll understand that. And so over the years, um, people who join as members receive quarterly newsletters and they help to fund and some other benefits, but they help to fund um, part of the ongoing efforts and what we do in preservation and education. Then we have people who give just during the great community give, for example, and just find that it's, you know, they've enjoyed a story. If they've been to a program, um, certainly at programs, we will suggest a donation and always fundraising. So, um, that's a great way to help. Volunteering is a great way to help. If you, are interested in a program or you have a story to share or you want need some help publishing a book there's i mean that we would be giving a resource to you because somebody in the past set up a fund for publications so um i think just reaching out and seeing where you fit that's really great which is an excellent lead-in question to this one. As we wrap up here, how best can the laugher stay updated with you on social media or otherwise? Penny, here at Rocktown History. Well, please go to rocktownhistory.com because that would be the, the first foremost place. It will tell you how to get here if you want to visit. It will show you our past events and what's coming up. It gives you resources if you want to do a bit of research on your own. We also are on Instagram and Facebook, and we have a growing YouTube channel. So a number of our events have been recorded and are online for people to view. We try to make sure that our programs are accessible by being hybrid, and it's sometimes been a joke to see Penny trying to create a (laughs) hybrid event, but um, for the most part, they seem to be working, and we... We are trying to add new equipment to improve some of the technical issues that we've had in the past. Um, But for the, you know, or, you know, just call me. Just call her. (laughs) Just call Penny. Don't wait. And thank you. I have to thank you so much, Penny. This has been incredibly educational, insightful, and fun chatting it up with you today on all things Rockdown history. Thank you for sharing and coming on the show. Well, it's just been so much fun and I'm I'm just delighted to be able to have had the opportunity and to have survived it. Thank you, John. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> she wasn't sure about this, Laughers. That was communicated in our email exchange. And I said, don't worry, it'll be a lot of fun. <laughs> yes, it's been fun. So thank you. You are welcome. Laughers, to learn more about Rocktown history, come to an event, explore their exhibits, dig into their genealogy, yours actually, or find out how you can support or volunteer, please visit their website at rocktownhistory.com. Dot org. That's rocktownhistory.org and you can get more information today. Also, don't forget that discount on Prepopsterus using promo code LAF15 at prepopsterus.com. That way you can munch on it when you join me on next week's episode. And lastly and most importantly, thanks for tuning in, laughers. Out of all the podcasts out there, you picked us and we think that's pretty darn special just like you. Until next time, keep smiling. Bye. Bye.
Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Virginia is for Laughers podcast brought to you by X2 Comedy. We'll be dropping a new podcast every Wednesday. So check back for another uplifting episode. Come to an X2 Comedy show or let us bring one to you. To find out more, head to x2comedy.com. Be sure to share this podcast with a friend. And until next time, cheers. Cheers.